Serrington, before we get started with this week's episode, I just want to thank you all for your support. The outcry of love and praise has been amazing, and I am so excited to continue on this journey through prayer history with all of you. Thank you for supporting, liking, and subscribing. Now let's go on with the history. After World War II brought an influx of queer people to port cities across the United States, many organizations came together in an attempt to build upon the sense of group consciousness. But in a society that criminalized homosexuality, a young Harry Hay frequented underground gay bars while his wife stayed at home. It is here at these underground gay bars that Hay and a few other men began thinking of creating a society where men could come together with the goal of furthering the homosexual community. Hay believed that if they could bring together enough homosexuals in America, then they could organize a mass movement defending homosexuality against discrimination and criminalization. In 1950, with the help of Chuck Rowland and Bob Hole, Hay established the Mashing Society, a secret homophile organization in Los Angeles. I'm Alexis Arrington, and welcome to Everyone's Gay, A Look into Queer History. to elicit public change. Kinsey's work estimated that 10% of the American population was involved in homosexual activities. We now know that the sample was a little bit skewed, only looking at certain populations, but at the time it was used to inspire Hay to mobilize, which he did, founding the Matching Society. The Society's goals were simple yet epic. First, to unify homosexuals isolated from their own kind and create a feeling of belonging. Second, to educate homosexuals and heterosexuals toward the acceptance of an ethical homosexual culture. And third, to lead more socially conscious homosexuals to provide guidance to the whole mass of the homosexual population. Now you might be thinking that homosexuality is illegal at this point in U.S. history. So how was the Mashing Society able to meet without being arrested? Well. Hay was a card-carrying communist. And if you know anything about the late 1940s to early 1950s, it's that anti-communist propaganda and persecution was running rampant in the U.S. As McCarthy and others who participated in the Red Scare were hunting down communists, the party worked to ensure that they could still meet without detection. The avenues and secrets used by the Communist Party to plan and hold meetings were the same tactics used by Hay to ensure that the Madison Society was a safe place for men to gather. Meetings were held in an undisclosed location, and one could only attend if they knew a member of the organization. They would tell the interested new member to meet at one location, and then he would be picked up by current members and taken to the meeting. This was all to ensure that he was not an undercover police officer from the vice squad. In 1951, Mashing began sponsoring discussion groups and provided lesbians and gay men similar opportunities to share openly about their feelings and experiences. These meetings were emotional and cathartic for members. And from 1950 to 1953, attendance snowballed as groups effectively built gay consciousness throughout the country. Chapters began springing up in other cities, including San Francisco, New York, Chicago, and DC. And the group was pushed forward into political action. We see this in the spring of 1952, when one of the original members of the group was entrapped by the LA Vice Squad. Imagine decided to mobilize the community and challenge the case in court. Under the name of Citizens Community to Outlaw Entrapment, Mashing hired a lawyer, raised funds, published a newsletter, and distributed leaflets. At the end, the jury was unable to reach a verdict, and therefore the case was dismissed. This was a victory for the Mashing Society, as an acknowledged homosexual had beaten the vice squad in court. One of the ways that the Mashing Society was able to get their name to the public was through their magazine, One Magazine. 
This magazine was nationally distributed and published from 1950 to 1967. It survived threats from police and federal government in order to provide news, essays, fiction, and queer content to homosexuals across the United States. Both LA police and FBI officers came to one's offices in 1953 and confiscated copies of the magazine, arguing that they could not send them through the mail due to their homosexual content. This was the start of several court fights to ensure that one could be sent to homosexuals across America. In 1958, one received a ruling from the Supreme Court over three years after the original publication of the issue in question. The ruling, one incorporated versus Olson, reversed the decision of the lower courts and agreed that homosexual content was not fundamentally obscene. Therefore, one magazine was allowed to be distributed through mail once again. This was a landmark case, as it was the first time in U.S. history that the Supreme Court had heard a case concerning homosexuality. For more information on the Mashing Society, you might want to check out the podcast Mashing, a Queer Serial by Devlin Camp. It tells the story of the Mashing Society in more depth and detail and is very well done. The Mashing Society was built off the group consciousness coming out of World War II, and it started the homophile movement. Throughout the history of queer people in the United States, their name pops up several times they're one of the first nationally recognized organizations to fight for the rights of queer people in America. We will definitely see them again in future episodes. In the next episode, we will be taking a deep dive into the Mashing Society's sister organization, the Daughters of Belitis. I'm Alexis Arrington. Thank you for watching Everyone's Gay, a look into queer history, and we'll see you next time. If you like what you saw, make sure to hit that like button below and subscribe. Still not sure? Well, here's a cute puppy.